and intentional work that involves the Kensington Market community, as well as artists across North America. So welcome, Pat. And Marie Soto is our Philippine futurist, art witch, and storyteller. She is a dynamic community catalyst with a 10 years plus of experience in arts leadership, cultural strategy, and creative programming. Marie has previously exhibited at Artscape Young Place, the Gladstone Hotel, and Harbor Fund Center. She has been working alongside Kat at 187 Augusta for the past two years. And in addition to this work, Marie is part of Kensington Tenants Network and other anti-gentrification initiatives. She's energized by imagination and inspired by community, and she hopes to build a loving and just future for future ancestors. So welcome everyone, and I'll give Gerald the floor to tell us a little bit about the project. Thank you very much for that, and uh, thank you so much for, for having us here today. Um, yeah, so I'm going to speak first, and I'll, I'll speak briefly, uh, mainly just to provide an overview of the overall project. Um, I should mention that the project was made possible through funding through the Toronto Arts Council Open Door Program, uh, and we're very grateful for that support. Now, I'm the managing director uh, at Ukai Projects, and Ukai Projects is a relatively new arts organization in Toronto. And we're interested in models of producing culture outside of, of capitalism. Um, and specifically, we're interested in approaches that, that are outside ideas of growth and, and efficiency as, as moral positions. And what that means is that like growth and efficiency, they're wonderful things, um, but other values are, are possible and, uh, and desirable. And so we, we support different ends in the work that we do, and then we explore the means available um, to achieve those ends. So in community development, um, the ends are, are often burned into the process. Uh, projects like Sidewalk Labs, they, they take for granted that efficiency is, and scale are, are ideal outcomes to pursue. So the process reflects the product. Um, and efficiency requires abstraction. Uh, people become data points or another object to, to uh, optimize. And we, we sort of follow or believe the anarchist principle of, of prefiguration, which basically means that if you want compassionate communities, then you need uh, compassionate processes to get you there. And if you want uh, mutual aid, then you need to do that through mutual aid. Um, you can't get to a, a peaceful future through violent means. And so our, our approach echoes that, that belief. Now, um, artists are often included in community development, um, often to provide social license in early stages or, or decoration at the end. Uh, a development or process will involve artists early to demonstrate that they're engaging with a broad cross section of stakeholders or artists um, are, are brought in at the end to, to uh, improve the palatability of the outcomes that came from the process. Now, artists will respond, um, but they're not actually involved in shaping the values toward which the project moves. And this project was an attempt to, to develop some experiments in, in changing that pattern of behavior. Uh, artists actually have a, a really critical role to play in community development and conversations about the future of communities. Um, artists draw attention to how we are organized uh, by the world and they make the invisible visible. They uh, give themselves and others permission uh, to be organized in different ways uh, or for different reasons. Uh, in ancient Greece, I love history, but um, tragedy and comedy, these ideas came out of rituals of, of disorder that were in service to Dionysus. Um, we have these centralizing forces and then we have others that push back on that. And that's often been the role of the artist in society. And we need these centrifugal forces um, that question and draw attention to how things are going um, because we need more choices in how our communities are developed. Artists disorganize things and they replace them with something new. And technologies in Western cultures, they're, they're almost always turned toward order 
and organizing and control. Think of the evolution of the internet or, or what we're dealing with with AI right now. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, technologies can help things grow or to make them more efficient or they can help people care for each other. And these projects that you're gonna hear about, um, they looked at how art and technology might be leveraged to tell and gather different stories uh, about community. And I think you'll see that there's some really beautiful outcomes that came out of it. So what develops when we draw on a sense of intimacy and connection in the work that we create? If a stranger with a clipboard stops you on the street and asks you a question, you're gonna give a very different answer than if your neighbor stops you and asks you a similar question. The nature of the relationship has a huge impact on the types of answers that we get. Yvonne Illich uh, was a Roman Catholic priest and a writer, and he worried that technology was becoming um, useful things for useless people. And he wanted to know what technologies might look like if they help people and communities um, become more useful to grow. And to him, useful wasn't sort of meant in a utilitarian way. He was talking about useful as being capable of giving love, uh, of care, of compassion for others. And, and all of these projects, they, they do just that. They are created to center care and connection. None will scale, um, but each has created new connections and new conversations that allow for new things to happen. And if information is a difference that makes a difference, then our hope in this was to try to redefine the things that make a difference. So Kensington's, and I, I don't live in the market, um, which, is, which is why I'm, I'm very pleased to be turning this over to others that do, but Kensington's identity is eclectic, joyous, uh, it's weird. And so we need approaches that recognize different goals and that create conditions of trust for that weirdness to continue. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mina, who share a little bit about the project that she worked on. Um, it's wonderful that we're sharing two of the projects here. There were more that came out of it as well, um, but thank you again and to Mina. Thank you, Jerry. Um, okay, I guess I'll just start sharing my screen. And uh, you can see this site, yeah? Sorry, I didn't, was that a thumbs up or? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, I'm just briefly just going to discuss my um, intent. So I work to employ an ontology of togetherness and care and to consider an epistemological shift where we could utilize vulnerability and narrative empathy through storytelling to exercise resistance to dominant ideologies around power, land, and agency in the context of a pandemic and neighborhood development. So I looked at how COVID-19 and gentrification in some ways worked hand in hand and how discourses around our vulnerability to both uh, can feed into the notion that isolation and disconnect are good for us and that settler colonial capitalist and individualist values are ideal. Through storytelling, we can utilize radical vulnerability, which is deeply political because the relations between us, the interdependence that constitutes a shared agreement between us can be organized by us. So we're living in a time when I think many of us are experiencing cognitive dissonance. Our invulnerability is the difference between life and death in the context of a virus, but in our attempts to not be vulnerable, we experience greater isolation, which weakens our immune defenses and spirit, which in turn makes us more vulnerable. Open and vulnerable storytelling, however, can create counter narratives that break down the infallibility of systems of power. And through this installation, I hope to foster integrated connectedness to a storytelling network, which precipitates gentleness, destabilizes problematic systems of power and supports collective action. So my installation is very much about community members bringing their own knowledge and experiences to the table, including people who have been marginalized by dominant discourses and don't necessarily see themselves represented and these people being the experts of spatial planning. And the basic concept, so I unfortunately didn't take many photos of um, it before it had to go into storage, but this is generally what uh, one of the booths looks like. So the basic concept is this, 
these two booths are situated out of eyesight from each other in Kensington. They have tablets situated in them. Two people can call each other and they're prompted to share their answers to storytelling questions. And that was key because I did not want another forum for the small talk of, hey, what's up? Not much here, cool, bye. Um, and then after answering three questions, the installation was over and they could meet at a meeting spot. And I wanted the anonymity of um, both to create a level of comfort about not being seen and to challenge people's understandings and biases of their neighbors. Uh, there were a number of changes to the design, including a musical segment being added and another installation mode was created in case one booth was occupied, but no one came to the other within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, so it was essentially a submission module where people could submit their answers and listen to or read the responses others have submitted. And possibly the biggest barrier for me um, was prior to the lockdown was finding a woodworking space. And, you know, due to COVID-19, many speakers, many maker spaces were either closed or at reduced capacity. And I posted in a workshop zone um, and I ended up having a friend I knew from my raving days contact me and let me know I could use his tools and space. And so you see that community building was my intent, but it was also my process. And you see this throughout the installation. So when I needed a decent mic for recording, um, when I was having difficulty getting a plug-in to fit my parameters, when um, I needed a space for the wheelchair accessible booth to go, which is essentially like a, it's like a little shed, like um, it's pretty huge. <laughs> um, so people stepped up and community members stepped up and people, really supported me every step of the way and were involved and consulted. And so design justice did inform my work. Um, one of the booths is wheelchair accessible. Both have chalkboard walls inside and I left both doors and pieces on the larger booth blank for the community to paint, sign, tag by giving voice to community members instead of just select individuals. I think we can foster subversive narratives that destabilize urban planning processes which aren't driven by the community. Um, but yeah, so lockdown happened and I had to store the booths and recognize that a physical installation was not feasible. And so we decided to shift the installation to a fully online one until further notice. Um, so there are Skype logins that I made so that this can essentially be simulated from um, the comfort of your home. But I'm just gonna take um, you through the submission module. So if you go to the site, connectionswithstrangers.com, um, you have the option to either book a spot, um, and that's for if you want to try to actually simulate the booth experience being paired with someone else, that's sort of on pause at the moment, but, you know, we're hoping to have that, um, be live, um, once the installation is, is running, um, and yeah, for the beginning, the submission installation, so you're taken to the instructions. And consent, and you can consent to um, listening to or reading other people's responses without actually having to submit your own. So you don't actually have to submit anything if you don't want to. And then there's a series of storytelling questions. So um, I feel like I said I wasn't going to play sound, but maybe I can try to play sound from um, this and you can let me know if you hear it. Um, so share a memory of a time when you were a kid and felt proud. Where were you and who were the people in your life? What did it feel like? Um, I agree. And uh, I think it was the first time I really saw my mom kind of being supportive about it. Um, Sorry, can, can folk, yeah, you can hear that. Okay, <laughs> just checking. Um, so just to give context, um, this is someone talking about being in a play when, uh, when he was younger. And uh, I think it was the first time I really saw my mom kind of being supportive about uh, like an activity that I did at school, but it was recorded and the whole thing. And it was, it was quite proud considering, you know, I stepped down of my of my comfort zone and as a kid being in front of so many people and kind of having that courage felt uh, pretty well and uh, and everything when the the play was was I thought at least was fantastic from what I can remember unfortunately I don't have the 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 video of the of the whole play but I quite remember kind of my mom and my grandmother being in front and and uh, being super into 
kind of helping us out and, and helping build the set and the whole thing. So that was quite, quite a pride, proud moment. Um, it just felt, I don't know, it felt like you were enough sort of thing. And I think what got me about this response was that line, it felt like you were enough. I think it really gets the root of what this work and this practice of care is about because a lot of us fear we aren't enough and how that interferes with our ability to connect and be vulnerable. Um, I think in trying to be vulnerable, we're sort of dancing around the possibility of shame or the fear of disconnection. Like if someone really sees you, you'll be cast out. And so I thought it was beautiful to hear that affirmation of worth. Uh, so there's a series of different questions and there's recorded answers as well as written answers. Um, another one. Um, so this question is, is there a quote saying that you identify with or that helped you get through a challenging time? Why does it have meaning for you? And <laughs> I'll just read a bit about uh, the segment from a poem by William Morris. Join in the battle where no man can fail for whoso fadeth and dieth, yet his deeds shall still prevail. In this way, if we fight, we win, even if that victory comes after us. And I think this really reiterates how important it is to fight for each other, to show up, even if you feel powerless or like you can't see the fruits of your labor. And especially within the context of um, Kensington Market, which is, you know, this amazing community with so much character, but um, which is gentrifying and changing very quickly. And, you know, um, a lot of people are discontent with the changes. Uh, so the questions I utilized were intrinsically motivating um, to me and to a number of people that I consulted, um, you know, having to do with identities, desires, obstacles, issues. And I think it's important to recognize the distinction between storytelling and narrated discourse. Um, and that I wanted to evoke the comfort that comes with the emotional distance provided by storytelling. Although I sought openness and vulnerability, I did not just want the questions to focus on barriers and trauma. Um, while these stories are obviously extremely important, I feel that voices of marginalized community members are too often defined by the violence done to them. So, yeah, there's a number of responses. And then the next part is just a little jam session. And this is just knowing, like if you have been to Kensington, you know how unbelievably musical it is. And you know, if you live in Kensington, <laughs> that it's like around the clock. Like you will hear people singing and playing um, their instruments and rapping and, you know, like, um, Bellevue Park is really such an epicenter for that. And so I, I wanted this to be an opportunity for people to just kind of have a bit of a jam, just, you know, without actually being seen. And so without sort of the embarrassment that sometimes might come from feeling like maybe you're not good enough. <clears throat> so although it was commissioned as a temporary installation, I do see great potential in it acting as a longitudinal participatory action project and simultaneously a structure of ongoing resistance informed by design justice pr principles. Our reliance on an increasingly digital world has fostered the creation of a virtual realism. And I think it's imperative that we ensure the relationships we experience to the environments which are digitally mediated still center what we strive for as a community connection. A particular interest to me is the notion that if these installations were to remain long enough and were indeed successful at being accessible as I had intended them, the neighborhood could slowly get to know each other and be connected. And yeah, this is an imagined future that brings me joy. Um, and that's all, thank you. Thank you, Mina, for sharing uh, your project. And I'm just gonna pass it on to Kat and later Murray to Tell us more about their project. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kat, and um, I'm just going to send you folks the, the, the link to our website. So for our project is Here and Now. Here and Now is a public art created by Kat Salika and Marie Soto in collaboration with Ukai Project, funded by Toronto Arts Council. 
So this project was created at a response of rapid gentrification and redevelopment were not only witnessed but experienced by firsthand as artists like me and Marie and Mina, um, as um, who also live and work in Kensington Market. It has impacted of COVID-19 and had left a local businesses and residents that struggling to survive. And through this project, um, especially through um, me and Marie, uh, we have decided um, to showcase Kensington Market and how important it is and how much love, it's like a love letter um, for Kensington Market through videos, um, interactive work and AR and like illustration and a little bit of everything and audio. So um, yeah, so we really want to focus on storytelling that and also like we have um, happily worked with Ukai projects from um, another residency and then this residency has touched base to us and we were super excited because um, especially during this COVID-19 um, it, it's also oh, it's been so um, interesting to connect again um, so we come along connecting with other groups like Mina and Humming Collective with this so about us um, as Cynthia was saying 187 Augusta is a grassroots arts community art space um, that's in Kensington Market, right in front of the park. Um, and we focus of femme identified and to um, LGBTQ plus um, of color. So BIPOC, um, black indigenous of people of color. And we started in 2017. And from that, um, we grew relationships from that um, as a community um, in creatives in around the city, um, especially Kensington Market. So it's been a hub um, in Kensington Market for um, the youth. Um, and yeah, so we've been here for three plus years and now we're on digital um, digital realm than physical realm due to the pandemic. And um, I wanna also wanna talk about my relationship in Kensington Market. Um, I've been a resident in Kensington Market um, for over four years, but also um, I've worked in Kensington Market since I was 19, so eight years of my life. And I wanna touch base about the relationship because um, it's really important um, for us to talk about it because of the storytelling that we wanna show and the experience of, um, of what I experienced and other people I've experienced. Um, through the relationships of um, I had and Marie has, um, we have created stories that uh, we wanted to ask questions, intimate questions to it, um, during, especially during pandemic and also the gentrification that's happening and redevelopment. Uh, we just want to remind that it's, it didn't happen only during pandemic, but it did happen before that um, of the redevelopment that's happening and the changes. Um, and it's been on the talks for quite a while. So um, so when we created this video, we have made questions um, alongside with different communities. For example, um, we have Sun from Seoul, um, Kensington, who was a resident, um, Alfonso, um, who owns El Gordo for over 15 years. And um, we have Serena Purdy, who um, is the chairman of Kensington, um, Friends of Kensington. So we have some questions that we wanted to show. Um, and Marie will just start playing it. I think Kensington Market is kind of synonymous with community. Um, there's a strong sense of community spirit and community care here. And that shows in the way that we do look out for each other through things like job loss and eviction and food insecurity. This is a neighborhood that has a diversity of income brackets as well as a diversity of, um, of religious uh, belief and of origin and language so I think we've 
you know, in terms of the day-to-day people that we, we know and interact with, um, you've, you've built a strong sense of being able to transcend boundaries that I think a lot of people will otherwise find tribalism in. And I think we've done a really beautiful job of, of helping, helping each other through COVID. Um, and I hope other communities experience that too. Yeah, so just one of those questions about care. Um, I think for um, for our project and also including the other projects that um, from this res res residency um, really just shows the, the care. And I think um, the care from different initiatives like Friends of Kensington, um, Kensington Tenants, um, it, it really does show how much we truly care for each other here and like, even though we keep saying Kensington, you know, keep Kensington weird, but also keep Kensington caring for each other. That's the mo a lot of importance to it. Um, and again, uh, we made some other art. So we did some video, um, some AR that we did, um, just talking about gentrification that's happening. Um, if there was an article that was posted that there was over 20 um, locations that was closing down um, in Kensington Market with within 2019 to 2020. And again, I just want to um, tell you again about that this gentrification did not happen during pandemic. It did happen before, but it grew rapidly, especially of what's happening in the city and the whole world. Um, as we, we talk about Kensington Market, uh, we also acknowledge that this is not happening just the market, but it's happening around the city and also around the world. And just, um, we want to give like a, like a love, you know, kind of like we won't forget the folks that's missing. For example, Crudar, um, he's been, he's, he was there for 10 plus years. And again, because of, the real estate, um, they just closed them down, like just in a snippet. And like Soul Vintage, she, they rented that space as a home for 15 years. And all of a sudden, within one year that they opened during pandemic, they had to close down. So we just wanted to show that in a way, in a fun way um, through AR. So we have like a snippet of a video that we wanted to do during um as a public art that we wanted to make a poster, put around the market and just like a fun way to do it in the AR code. Um, and yeah, just a reminder that this is really important for us that it's not forgotten about this community that has left because due to the redevelopment or higher stake, um, higher prices in the market. And I'm just gonna move on to Marie and we'll continue about the website. Marie, you're just on mute right now. Hi, can everybody hear my disembodied voice? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, that's good. Um, yeah, I am. So like Kat said, um, this project is a transmedia project. Um, we use different mediums to tell these stories and bring them to life. Um, and yeah, point just raise the surface, the kinds of things that we're noticing in terms of inequity, in terms of um, gentrification and redevelopment. And um, yeah, I so a lot of the illustrations on this website and the designing, um, yeah, I, I did a lot of the illustrations on here. So, and then, um, yeah, if you physically go to these locations, you can see that um, these spots have disappeared and um, you can act, there's, there's stories to how this has gone down and what's happening. And it's kind of a lot of things. It's one thing to know about it, but it's another thing to be living it here as we do. So, yeah. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the project and. Um, how it all kind of came to be. So 
what the the original concept was that we were um, we were going to collect stories from folks around the market and give people the opportunity um, to give the community to share their stories. These are people that we know. These are people that we love and who have uh, a relationship to the market that is longstanding um, and make help make Kensington what it is. Um, so. Um, these are illustrations of some of the buildings that are in the market and um, we felt like we're landmarks of Kensington and um, yeah we wanted people to physically have a little like a little walk through Kensington and be able to visit these places and um, we're you're going to make QR codes um, for people to scan on building faces and listen to the stories um and then since the since lockdown happened um we couldn't really do that so the the other the the pivot was to put together a website where people can kind of visit kensington on uh with on um through this web portal i'll show you in a minute but when when things open up um we're hoping that you can download our map uh and you know you can print it out for yourself and have a visit to these sites and listen in uh, and get to know Kensington through its stories, through the people that live and work here. Um, and yeah, if you if you uh, visit the website, you can just download and, and scan with your QR code and have a nice afternoon. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, yeah, we're gonna go on a, a little tour of Kensington uh, online <laughs> since we can't walk uh, and be together. So it's this is, this is kind of like a, a choose your own adventure type website. Um, if you go through the buildings, um, there's different links, there's different clickables, different things um, that you can, ways that you can explore. And there are stories, audio visual stories of people um, that we spoke to and have had a lot to say about Kensington. Uh, so we're gonna, just for today, uh, we're gonna start here. And we wanted to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, this is the foundation of and center of what we do in, in um, being conscious of treaty and in, in being beholden to treaty. And we hope that if you're on, if you're on uh, the website, you're clicking through as well, um, we kind of acknowledge, do an acknowledgement. And we, we wanted, people to have a little bit of a moment to think about it and think about what our relationship to land is. Um, Kensington has a long history and we, we, all, we all know that, um, yeah, we, we have a relationship to indigenous communities and that, that should be something that we kind of think about our connection to and how we can center that in our work and in our practices. Um, and yeah, so if you have something to say, please feel free to type out and email and send it to us. Um, we're going to go to Kent to 187 Augusta. So yeah, 187 Augusta, we're located in Kensington, right in the heart of Kensington. It's a storefront gallery. Um, you might catch me and Kat sitting on the stoop there. Um, uh, but yeah, we, so I actually moved here last year, but I've, been, I was one of those uh, kids that would always go to the market because I thought it was super cool <laughs> and I was just so romanticized it a lot. Um, so this is, these, these are our feelings of Kensington it's, uh, and, and captures, I guess, what we're seeing in real time happening. Um, yeah, and I guess this, this project is, is a response to all of that and what we think of what's going on. Um, so yeah, if so, if you're if you're curious, we we put together um, a little a little guide of the market. Um, so you can like this is how we would spend a day uh, going around the market, and um, you can you can totally do this in real life. Uh, but yeah, we're so we're, I'm going to take you along on this fun adventure through Kensington can hit all these spots actually. So if we go back home. <clears throat> and Bellevue Park right in the middle 
of Kensington Market. It's like an epicenter, always lots of activity. Thought this would be a good place for folks to kind of have a nice meditative moment. And breathe out. And just leave. Okay. And then I believe the next stop was powwow. Um, Kat has a relationship to the folks in powwow. They have really good uh, tacos, Kat. Taco, Indian tacos, and Sean dogs. Yeah. And this and is. Uh, that's Sean. That's the owner. Yeah, I'm drawing a heart around him. I don't know if you can tell <laughs> with my cursor. Um, and then we, when me and Kat go around the market, um, I always have a, I'm always have a, a, a crisis where like, I always get really hungry and then I try to decide whether, where I wanna eat because there's so many good places to eat. Um, it's inevitable, we end up at El Gordo. And we, so it's, it's right at Augusta and Baldwin. Um, it's like a little cafeteria and then there's a bunch of like other um, like vendors there. I would recommend the Campuchano taco. It's so good, it's so good, it's so good, it's so good. <laughs> there's, there's like chicharrones in it and like, um, like a cheese and pork it's, and chorizo, it's so good. Um, and we interviewed Dario Alfonso. Um, his family's been here for, uh, yeah, for 30 years. It's a multi-generational kind of business that's been owned. I do recommend that you, um, you visit it and check out his, his video. And I think the next stop, we can walk over to Handlebar. It's a bar right by um, Augusta and Dundas, that away. Uh, and this is really just an excuse to make a shrine for <laughs> karaoke, for hot breath karaoke. Uh, they had karaoke nights on Tuesdays. They're not open right now uh, for obvious reasons. And they also had live music um, with a lot of Toronto like local talent. Um, yeah, it, it was a really fun karaoke night. And then there's Celine Dion, if anybody wants to sing later. Um, <clears throat> and another shop, the Space Vintage, um, they painted like a lot of the exterior gold um, and Kat did an interview with Natasha and Ashleen and they're super cool mother-daughter yeah. duo. They're super cool and also they touch base about that that was happening about gentrification about honest ads because they were um they had a shop in markham street for over 10 years um the reason why they moved in kensington market is due to the gentrification that's happened so that's why they found a second home in kensington market yeah yeah and then yeah i think i saw them out um a little bit ago yeah, and then I think the last place uh, we would stop, there's just a bunch of, this is, it, there's just a bunch of stuff, like a bunch of knickknacks here. Uh, B&J Trading Co. right at Spadina and Baldwin. Um, people know Benny. Uh, he's, he's the owner of the shop. He has like a really dry sense of humor. Um, but yeah, you can literally find anything there. And he, <laughs> it, you, yeah, it's, we, so I guess, yeah, this project is a lot about the relationships that we have with these people. And um, yeah, it's, it, so when I went to go talk to him about the project, he was like, well, what will art, do, like, what will that accomplish? Like, what will making art do? And I was like, a little bit heart, my tiny heart was a little bit broken by that. Um, but I was like, we're, we're telling people's stories and that's something that I think is compelling and that's something that can mobilize people and is like an impetus for people to care um you know so I was like so yeah and the thinking was um you know what will the future of Kensington look like um like I imagine like maybe there's going to be future artifacts from Ken, Ken um from Benny shop 
Um, and you can check out some of the 3D models. He has a bunch of like seashells there. He has incense. Just go visit Benny. Come for the come for the knickknacks. Stay for the company. I recommend. Um, yeah. And then if you'll notice, we did have a link to an alternate reality um, world. And deep breath, everybody. We're gonna go to another reality. And this is another version of what Kensington could look like in the future. Um, and a lot of the buildings here in the previous page were white, white out um, because they were shut down, if you'll notice. Um, yeah, and also on the map, the buildings that the places that have been shut down are indicated on a printable map. So this is kind of the worry of what Kensington will look like. Kat, how are you feeling? Stress. <laughs> <laughs> there was like once at one point like 17 dispensaries. Yeah, there was over 17 dispensaries um, yeah. one time in 2017. And then when it got legalized, obviously all of them, most of them shut down, but slowly um, the dispensary is actually showing up again. Actually, there's like three only in Augusta but they're big so there's a lot it just there's feels, a lot there's there's that's one too many already yeah um and like we're also seeing like a lot of redevelopment happening like just in the periphery like Chinatown the 315 Spadina um there's a condo development happening there um also along College and Bathurst um and I'm Dundas part, and yeah Augusta yeah the back Alexander Park and then um, some of us and myself are, we're, I'm part of um, just the Kensington Tenants Network and we are aware of the developments that are happening. Some folks are also part of the, Ken, um, the development committee and are in working groups in consultation with the city and what's going on. So this is like, there's a lot already in motion and it's something that's like at the top of mind as artists and residents here. Um, but we are hopeful of the future and hopefully things will change. Um, I think my screen is taking a bit to load, but yeah, it's, it's come into focus. The future is coming into focus <laughs> as we go along. Um, we hope that things will change. We hope that with what we do and what we talk about and if it's coming in from a real place, it will appear and yeah i think there's a lot of things um that we that we kind of talked about that overlap which is that there is care there are people here that recognize kensington as a site for um you know as as a community and as a as a network and something that hopefully through the by by staying authentic to ourselves and by supporting each other we can um we can create we can co-create a future that um where everybody's taken care of where everybody has everything that they need and yeah and where everybody just doesn't survive but lives thank you so much marie for those thoughts um about the, the future and taking us on, on a virtual walk of, of Kensington and Kat as well um, for bringing this, this project to life. So thanks uh, Mina as well for sharing the, the stories and, and Gerald for framing uh, how this, this project came about and the, the support of participation from UPI projects. I'm, I'm so thrilled to be um, listening to this conversation and this project about Kensington. So I shared uh, with you when, when I first moved into to Toronto over a decade ago from, um, from the Dominican Republic, when I encountered Kensington Market, that I was so, so thrilled because I, it was the one place where it finally felt like home and I would hang out there all the time. And it, it really was a welcoming community. Uh, the, the, the space was um, so, so nurturing and caring. It even translates to those of us that are new to the city. So it, it's, it's so 
it, it's so that warmth it's so relatable for for people uh whether you're in the city for one day uh as a, as a tourist when that could happen um or if you're calling this home or or not it's it's such a such a vibrant place that it exudes um and it's certainly worth worth keeping that that vibrancy and protecting it so um as we open up our, our conversation, um, this is a good segue um, to, to explore a little bit more the topic, the title of this conversation. And uh, there is so much pride expressed in that phrase, keeping Kensington weird. Uh, but there's also a sense of urgency to protect and defend its character. So um, what's behind this unofficial Kensington slogan, as you explained to me? And why is it important to bring this slogan into our conversation and into your work? And um, I, I will start maybe with Nina to give her give us her thoughts. Um, so I think there's been a lot of change in Kensington and in the rest of Toronto, and the residents and business owners and workers and people who spend so much time here are trying to fight to maintain what makes Kensington so great. Um, a lot of us don't want Kensington to just be a bunch of condos and like overpriced stores that sell like artisanal jam or like a lot of us want safety, but we don't want cops coming in through the park and harassing people. And to be honest, like primarily racialized and marginalized people. And there have been ongoing challenges for some time, but COVID in some ways has been sort of a catalyst um, for some of the negative impacts um, because a lot of businesses haven't been able to run at full capacity or at all. And so they've had trouble paying rent um, and landlords have pushed them out, like what happened with Crudar and Round. And I think to understand the weirdness of Kensington, um, it's important to situate it within the context of Toronto on a wider scale, like affordable rent, affordable food, art that exists um, for a purpose other than to make money, like those things are becoming an anomaly um, in Toronto and communal spots where people can meet up, they can eat, play music, skateboard, rollerblade, skate, do yoga, bring their bunnies. Like I know multiple people that bring their bunnies to Bellevue Park. And I feel like a lot of people upon seeing that would be like, that's weird. <laughs> um, but I think just things change so fast. And sometimes it's under the guise of being something better. And so I think it's important to be really critical and ask, like, is the food more expensive at this new restaurant that opened up because the employees are getting paid better, the ingredients are fresher, or is it solely for the owner's gain? And is that what the market needs? Like if the most marginalized people who live and eat and work here and spend time in the market can't afford it, then who is it for? So I think it becomes a slippery slope, like small businesses get replaced, policing increases and art minimizes or becomes more commercial and the market changes and it's no longer diverse and full of music and color and character and depth. And I don't know, I, I just feel like before you know it, you're not going to be able to get like empanadas from three different countries. And I love that about the market. Like, I love how diverse it is. And I love that people come here who, you know, like maybe they were like, oh, I'm fine in, in the annex. I'm fine in Parkdale, but it didn't necessarily feel like a community. And I moved here in like I'd lived here in the past before, but I moved here again in April of last year, at the beginning of the pandemic. And I, I can't really imagine what my life had would be like if I had moved somewhere else because it's really hard to find community at all, but finding community during a pandemic, like it was really remarkable and amazing. Um, so I think it's important to bring the conversation into our work because we need to preserve this character of Kensington and also just to protect those who may not always feel like they have a voice or maybe they're just like too overworked or exhausted to actually be able to like yell their voice and that's completely valid and so i don't know i think it's important to show people that we're here and we're here for them and resisting change that they don't want and the futures that we're imagining don't have to be just imagined
that's certainly a, a, a beautiful thought. They don't have to be imagined and community have such a huge stake and part uh, at making that, that future that it's being envisioned and to do it collectively. Uh, so, so absolutely. Um, wondering, Gerald, uh, in terms of like the title and keeping Kensington weird as you guys working with, um, with artists and communities in Kensington Market, uh, what's your view on that? I mean, two things, I'll, I'll echo what Kat and Marie and Mina have said, that the, the care and the weirdness go together. Um, the, the not, it's not about like tolerance. There's actually this embrace of, of different ideas of what a beautiful life involves. Um, and, and when we lose that opportunity to actually embrace someone else who may may understand the world differently, um, we lose opportunities for for collision and for serendipity, and that's where a lot of the the weirdness comes from. Is because there's space for for different ideas of of what a good life is to coexist. Um, yeah, and and I'll add like that that. If every if every store is a dispensary, then the opportunities for fortunate accident, for serendipity, for collision, for mixing are are really reduced. And so we may not we may not see the impact um, directly, but we do see it in the ingredients that become available for new things to happen. And one of our worries at Ukai is that. Like we don't know the kinds of problems we're going to be dealing with in 10 years or 20 years. And we're, we're not sure what kind of solutions we're going to need to draw on. But we keep making choices that reduce um, the options that we have. There was a survey done in Ontario prior to COVID um, where up to 40% of individuals only had meaningful communication with people in their own household. And that number has gone up. And that is in Kensington Market, that's, that's Ontario wide. Um, and so if we have fewer opportunities to connect and if we, if the structure of our communities increasingly reflects a narrow set of priorities, then those opportunities for serendipity disappear, whether we've chosen it or not. Um, and so for me, that's, that's a big part of it is the one that the care and compassion and the weirdness are, are are just different aspects of the same feature. Um, and that the structure, like our cultural assumptions start showing up in the structure of our communities. And that really can impact the, the types of conversations and the types of meetings that, that we're able to have. Absolutely, I think that um... It, it kind of like shows um, some of the things that Mina was saying about like the, the the benefit of moving back into this caring and nurturing community during a pandemic versus uh, how a pandemic right now uh, is really pushing us to to disconnect and have that lack of community uh, support and, and network that that perhaps we were used to or had had more accessible or sometimes even taken for granted. Um, so my, my next question to, to, to the group is regarding the historical significance that Kensington uh, has. We know that um, it's, its importance it's extends beyond downtown Toronto. And an example is that in, 20, in 2006, the market was designated a National Historic Site of Canada. So with national importance uh, and in record, mission for its vibrancy, but also the, uh, the distinct character of place. Um, however, we have to know that that vibrancy and uniqueness is defined and shaped by people, um, and especially by the role that engaged individuals, collectives, and organizations play uh, in, in that community. So um, I would want to get your views and starting with, with Kat is how does being part of such an active community inspire your work and move you to build partnerships and collaborations, um, especially with 187 Augusta? And then um, as well, if, what are other Kensington organizations or groups that you want people to know about uh, and support uh, us with the, with the work that's being done in Kensington? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, so pretty much like what inspired like 187 being part of that is because of like before us, before 187 Augusta was part of it, there was other organization like how I me and Marie met from through Capisana. So it's a Filipino like community group that was underneath of the shop that I was working at and just connecting on that and also like the history of it. So like um, it, it used to be like, it still is a, um, like a collection of folks of like from Jewish communities and and also from the, the Jamaican communities and the like, you know, Vietnamese and the Chinese communities and then just like community on that and like what I've been hearing and keep speaking about it, about like, just like the creatives, like it, what Marina was saying, like, but like, it's a little bit of everything that bring your own bunny and also like artists who wants to create, like, I feel like there's so many, like it inspired me to create my own world and sharing that, but also like other like new shop owners um, who are coming in too is because they, they were inspired by the essence of the Kensington market and also like um, having each other's back for sure. Um, I think that inspired me to just play more. I think as a creative being of like, I can do this. Like uh, as like a, what like identify femme or like recognize as a female person, a woman of color and also like a plus size to create this different realms and share with other folks in the community who wouldn't judge you or just like think it's weird like bad weird but it's like cool weird that you're all doing that and like recognizing like um there's so many other um organization like for example like right before 187 there was 185 literally right beside us and i didn't know about that so they were like black creators who um who just wanted to create something in kensington market and there were also a diy space who made like, um, like the um, the sculptures? Those metal sculptures were made of one of the creatives there. Who they they did performance outside. They did shows, and just like kind of like it's just like sending off without even saying it and sharing it. Um, and like exact the same thing as Double Double Land. It's been there for so long and like doing the um art shows and music and just like playing there's i think it's really rooted about care play and just like evolving of what kensington market is um that's why we're so tight knit and also don't want to change in in the way of like gentrification of like we don't want like 12 wine rack and like 17 dispensary or like a bougie coffee place that's like a hundred dollars for a coffee bean. We don't want that. We want like independent owners who can live and also work and also be thriving upon it. Um, it's just showing that just like so much fun to it. I think that inspired me about Kensington Market and also like, again, I was saying about 185 um, Kapisana and um, friends of Kensington who's been there for over 15 years and also help about the gentrification and redevelopment um, to support to like that and also like um, Kensington tenants. Um, there's also like um, other groups. Um, I forgot their names, but there's one group that literally just funds the, the piano in the park because they want more music and share that. And like, even though there's like other initiatives or other groups, um, they're not even a collective, but they're just a group of friends who just want to support Kensington Market or even volunteer to just like clean up Vel uh, Belvenue Park, just like clean it up. So I think um, it's just like a s groups of people that even though they don't speak as a group in different collectives, they just still like do things just to have that energy of the market. Um, but yeah, uh, I think there's just so many love and care about the market. Um, and I really do like, you know, wish that there's more of that. Um, and I think especially during COVID-19, um, 
they're just trying to make it more accessible even though like I think I met um more like more people during COVID-19 all obviously online and also like just bypassing just like yeah So we have the same question um, to you in terms of um, what is it like being part of this community and building collaborations and partnership to inform your work and and also um, to to work with other organizations that people can support and follow to to make sure that the that the community is being is being engaged and the work that you're doing is also known by others outside of the community. Um, yeah, so I think being like I'm I'm like built by community. Um, I came out of, like I got my first opportunity to coordinate programs and like a graffiti program, a mural program, mosaic program in. Uh, the Western New York region, and it was a free program, and I was very young, and, but people, uh, like, that was the catalyst for me being engaged in community because I got an opportunity, which, like, propelled me to do more. It was someone validating my work, and then, like, I, I grew up in Scarborough, an under-resourced, like, community, infrastructurally, and in terms of, like, city budgets, um, and I didn't have access to art. I didn't have access, like there was no arts programming. There were no supports for like tech programming or like <laughs> things like that, or like digital infrastructure when I was growing up. So I like when it's something that, um, like it, it was something that art was something that <laughs> it made me feel like my most self and was like my way of being a person and becoming and um, being able to just to create was something that is um, part of my identity. So I, I don't know, it does, it's, it's not a conscious choice to be like, I am now actively part of this community. I am now <laughs> doing this thing. It's a matter of like, well, of course, it's, it's like you, we are intricately connected, like as we're seeing in this pandemic, we are inextricably interconnected what we do. And I think also from my like cultural diasporic background as a Philippine ex person, it's a concept of bayanihan. Like you just, you help because you're part of this group and your survival is tied to one another. Um, and like, I, I think we're seeing a lot more of like the mutual aid things happening where these, like Kat was talking about these initiatives of groups that are like doing um, fundraisers, like to help support a neighbor or like, talking about something that's happening and like supporting tenants. Um, it's it's part of like when we help ourselves, like when we help the community, we're helping ourselves. And that's that's just what you do. <laughs> um, and like, I think, um, yeah, building partnerships. I feel like Kensington is very specific in the way that um, it's a very close knit like community and I think we were we were talking to Mina about it um, a few days ago and it's like a lot of this area is very specifically demarcated as Kensington like you just know it's Kensington so you can't help but get to know someone because it's like things are tightly packed you see what's going on in the street you get you you pass by the same people who are sitting on the block um, and I think it's just like, um, just, yeah, you, you just, you're conscious of what's going on and you know people. And like, I think, especially like as an artist that I don't have like a lot of resources or financial means, building partnerships and collaborations are ways to make something collectively and make it work together and something that is reflective of the community. Um, so yeah, and I think, I think, um, yeah, I, I feel like, yeah, it's it's just it's it's part of um, what what ha I think what has to be now, and in terms of like being able to work as like collectively and collaboratively, and um, yeah, other like other advocacy groups that uh, I, I know are active in the area, 
Um, there's, there's also Friends of Chinatown, which is nearby where they're doing a lot of stuff. There's a community fridge <laughs> just down Darcy and um, Spadina Street. And um, St. Stephen's has, they, they help the community as well um, with social services. Um, there's, um, yeah, I'm part of Kensington Tenants Network where we do a lot of um, tenant support and tenants rights advocacy and um, anti-gentrification stuff. Uh, and I will say encampment support down by Alexandra Park. Um, there's folks that are supporting folks who are living in encampments down there and offering supplies and food and yeah, some, some cool stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's really important. Uh, as part of the James Walk, there's going to be a panel about uh, encampments as well. Like, so I encourage you to check that out as well. And I think it's really, it's really key as to say that it's such a close knit uh, community. And like just thinking of how uh, Nina's project in storytelling and reaching out to people and make sure that that connection takes over. Uh, it, it's it's still happening uh, in the market, like through physical and someone's like vintage loop, uh, telephone booth. It's super, super uh, important connection to make. And um, I, I would first encourage the the audience if they have any questions to please send it on on the chat, um, and and we we will be taking your questions and having the panel um, discuss it. And in, in the meantime, I, I, I would like to ask you about the, the framing of this conversation as um, we're looking at the intersection between public space, technology, and community engagement. And as uh, both of your projects uh, exemplify that, especially like pivoting from something that perhaps had a more physical um, a physical being into uh, incorporating technology and finding ways to, to translate into digital world. Um, how, why is bringing uh, technology into this equation uh, between public space and community development vital for your community and to create it or keeping those connections? And maybe, yep, Kat, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I think it's because again, um, through like technology is really important because again, we, we can't see each other physically. And also um, I can talk about just like about the shop owners in that in our community um, because they always feel so isolated that they're not the only, like they're the only one who's feeling this. So I think, um, I guess um, through technology, through storytelling of videos, um, it just showcased that, that they're not the only one and there's more um, more ways to communicate and to reach out um, of support of each other. So Gerald, you, I'm sure you have thoughts about technology and how it intersects uh, with public space and community engagement. So you Kai being such a big advocate for, uh, for technology and how that compassionate process uh, in usage of technology, um, wondering what, why is it vital to bring technology into conversations about public space and community engagement? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's a, that's a really, that's a really good question. Like, I think often we blame, we blame technology um, for human choices. Um, you know, we, we, we choose isolation collectively, we choose gentrification, and then technologies get leveraged in support of those ambitions. Um, but they don't have to be like, uh, you know, augmented reality or telepresencing like the two projects embody, they, they don't have to, to serve to alienate us from each other, from where we live. They can serve to connect us, um, but too often the, the, the folks that control the development of these tools, they, they are prioritizing very narrow sets of values. And, and so all we're trying to show is that other things can be centered, right? Like we, we can actually leverage these tools to connect people, um, to celebrate care and compassion. And it's harder because the, the tools are often they're often developed with 
particular uses in mind, but this is what artists are great at doing, right? At, at turning tools to different uses and imagining different approaches. Um, and that's, and for us, at least that's, that's it. Cause part of it is like, if we blame the technology, then we don't have to take responsibility for the choices that we make. Like Kensington's what, 4,000 people. Um, a quarter of the population earn less than 10,000 a year, according to the census data. Um, you know, the average salary is somewhere around 30,000 less than the average city of Toronto salary. But the gifts that they give to the rest of the city are absolutely massive. And if we allow Kensington to disappear or the character of Kensington to disappear, that isn't technology's fault. Um, that's, that's the fault of people who make decisions about the type of society we want to live in. And so for us, that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's the reason to do this is because it, 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 it makes it harder for us to avoid our own accountability um, for what happens next. Like we're actually undersigning the decisions that get made in our name. Can I just add on to that with, um, I feel like a lot of times technology is developed with design features that don't really properly account for how human psychology affects outcomes. And, you know, um, I think we're largely social creatures and people want to be in the know and be connected. Um, like I, I listened to this podcast where uh, when one person in a room starts looking at their phone, it increases the frequency with which like everyone else in the room starts looking at their phone. Like we all just kind of want to be connected. We want to be in the know. And if someone's looking at their phone, it's like, I need to know what they are looking at. Um, and yeah, I think there's a lot of gaps in terms of actually addressing that, you know, a lot of tech was created to aid in uh, social connection, but it sort of replaced it and, or like created distances that didn't really exist before. And while there are some benefits, especially like during a pandemic, like for gamers, you know, you can still speak to your friend from the comfort of your own home and the safety of your own home. But you know, um, when you're not going to a friend's house, like you used to, or even dare I say like an arcade, what are you missing out on? You know, you're missing out on community, you're missing out on all those experiences. And so I think, you know, really trying to address those gaps. Um, when I was trying to kind of like think about how to make these phone booths, you know, it was kind of a thought like, well, I could just make two phone booths with phones. I didn't think that that was very accessible for people with hearing impairments, but it could also just be like, yeah, you, why don't you just have whatever conversation. But I think like we have so many apps and forums where people are just sort of left to their own devices. And it's like none of us were properly socialized to like recognize like small talk is boring. We all hate it, but we all reflexively do it, you know? Um, and so that's why I kind of wanted to create the structure where people are you know, they're given the instructions to sort of play this game to get to know each other and actually share, you know, these details about each other and engage in sort of that narrative empathy and being able to be vulnerable. Because otherwise, I do think reflexively, we're all kind of guarded, we're all kind of just talking about our lack of weekend plans or, you know, the weather, and it's not enough, we kind of you know, if technology is going to be guiding us to some extent, then I think there needs to be more like thought into how, how we're building it and what values it's centering. I think that's such an important point about like, well, how, how is this being created and by whom? And in, in, in your work specifically, like the the depth and richness of those questions is what actually makes it different from simply just going uh, beyond that chit chat and small chat that, that you wanted to to avoid and, and it's it's really making it more more human because uh, otherwise that um, just sending an emoji it's not communication um, so so yeah it, it's an, a very important point um, that that's very very well shown in, in how the booth work. So um, my last question to, to the panel, we have about like five more minutes um, for, for a discussion is, 
stating the obvious that we're we're having this conversation within the James Walk uh, Festival. And as we know, James Walk um, commemorates the, the, the legacy of Jane Jacobs, uh, specifically uh, as an urbanist and her advocacy and activism um, for community-based uh, urbanism and the, the approach to city building and how it, it is all of, about, about the people, people make cities. Um, so I'm just wondering, what are some of Jane's beliefs that resonate or align with the work that you do and um, specifically how you see yourself living in Kensington and in this, in this community and your approach to, your own approach to community-based work. And um, I'll let whoever feels encouraged first to speak up uh, to do so. Gary? I'll, I'll just quickly chime in with um, like, uh, well, I think population density, because I think that that's pretty key. When I lived in Kensington like a decade ago, um, there was only like one bar that was open at night. And, you know, people told me like, don't go to it because Kensington is seedy at night, you know? Um, so now like walking around at different times of the day and night and it, there's still people around, there's still restaurants, you know, and it, there's still people in the park. And I, I know that that is sort of an issue that Kensington is still trying to deal with because we're trying to find a good balance between how can we remain safe um, and also like respectful towards people that do need to sleep at like four in the morning when the park is maybe like always alive, um, but without actually calling cops. So um, I, I do see the importance though, like I would much rather have a park that has people in it than a park that doesn't have anyone in it. And I think that that has really, um, been such a godsend during the the pandemic just to have that life and creativity and be able to meet people and there's so many emerging artists and you know it's this environment where even people who are just sort of starting to dip their toes like I was you know very very new and just starting to kind of release and post some of my work and just feeling like I don't know but I felt so welcomed in Kensington and by Ukai and it's just been really great and I think having having people around you know that's that's how you form relationships that's how you form groups um that's how you meet people and yeah there's so many collectives there's so many oh I also just feel like we need to give a shout out to Humming Collective I don't think we gave a shout out to them when we we're talking about collectives and they are um situated in Kensington they were part of the Entangled exhibition that we did and um if anyone's interested they did these beautiful soundscapes with video as well um and of just sounds in Kensington but um yeah sorry back to population density yeah so I think it's it's important that you know we do already sort of have the small blocks Kensington's not actually so large um and yeah we already have the you know the the businesses are right next to the residents and everyone's sort of commingled um yeah, I feel like we have a lot of sort of like Jane Jacobs beliefs and principles align a lot with what we're trying to preserve as well as just the older buildings. Sorry, I feel like I said everything. <laughs> I'll, I'll add one quick note that, I mean, obviously Jane Jacobs is, is, is uh, admired currently, but you know, when she was active, um, her, her critics would, would demean her contributions um, by, you know, describing her as a housewife uh, with no degree, and uh, and so I think the connection is also around who who are the experts um, and who gets to make the decisions about what happens next. Um, and if you're if you have enough fight in you, um, then then I mean we all deserve to have. A voice in what happens to our communities, um, regardless of what degree we have or, or how those who disagree with us choose to describe us. 
Um, so I, I think that that was also a, a connection and an inspiration for some of the work is to, to ensure that everyone um, takes part. Yeah, I think, um, and yeah, just building off of what Jerry and Mina said, um, yeah, community, like, community, like community is at the center of what my work is about, and it's about um, just because, <laughs> because my origin story is from like the community and like coming out of that. Um, I think if it's yeah it's always the question of whose story is it, who benefits, and who gets to tell it. And that's something that I think we see a lot in art, um, or like now it's more coming into consciousness with more stories of BIPOC folks, of LGBTQ plus folks, um, where there there's, I guess, a more prevalent like consciousness now publicly of people being aware of that um because who is it serving and what's the point of making it um a lot of what we see in toronto is a lot of commercial artwork being made of and like these public installations of pieces of, of art that weren't made by someone that was in the community like I, I don't understand why if you go to regent park why isn't there a mural by the people there why isn't there why aren't there pieces there what was the consultation process like um who, where, where is this, where's the funding going and is it being um, redistributed to the community to preserve it? And what's the intention behind it? Um, and it's a very scary thing to see these things happening like with, with like the developments happening here and with these kinds of, with, with privatization, privatization of public space happening um, not far from us, like, who's who's being left out and like whose voices are being raised um and that's like it it should be it should be the communities and like we because you live on the ground you know what's happening you see it for yourself you hear things and like it's if it's art that's true to like i think the art should be true to what the story is and what the narrative is and who better to tell it than people who are living the experience and to also build like that kind of community. I think that is a, a beautiful, beautiful thought and certainly something that that needs to be said out loud over and over again and uh, remind people in case like for whatever reason they forget. Um, so on on that final thought, it's 2.30. I'm, I'm really going to give you a huge thank you for uh, working to keep Kensington weird, um, for contributing to your communities, for being relentless advocates to preserve um, the character of, of Kensington uh, through arts and creativity, and uh, to remind us that uh, cities are for people, public space are, for, are, are for, for the people, that communities have a voice and they need to be involved uh, in the process and in, in the decision making that it's, it's beyond consultation because uh, the decisions that are made for communities affect individuals uh, and it's it's very real, it's very personal. So I'm, I'm very grateful for you to share um, your projects with us, your creative process um, for um, and for enlightening us about the weirdness of, of, of Kensington and the future, what the future could be, including those those bunny. I hope that everyone go out uh, to James Walk website, check out the walks, go out on a on a stroll on this beautiful day. And thank you so much to everyone and the organizers too. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.